Ladies, gentlemen, and youth bowlers from around the world, my name is Don Agent, and welcome to this week's edition of the Kaggle Show. We are very fortunate to have back with us a dear friend of mine and colleague, John Janowitz, or as we call him, Double J. Yeah, brother. How are you, buddy? Good, man. Good, good. You've actually been around for a little bit. Typically, yeah. you're, uh, you're bouncing all over the place. Yeah. You've been home for a little bit. Yeah, I've been home for time. a couple months now. Yeah, I was, uh, I was at the Asian Games for a couple weeks, and uh, now I've had a little bit of a Spent a little time at home, so it's been kind of nice. Don't get ready for Team USA trials. I actually got to leave for Hong Kong next week to take care of lanes for the, um, the World Men's Championship. So uh, I've been going for about two and a half weeks there. But uh, yeah, other than that, uh, yeah, I've been home. So it's been kind of nice to be home on weekends and sleeping in your own bed. It's, Pay your own bills sometimes. Yeah. You know, like actually get your mail from the mailbox. Yeah, box, yeah exactly. Yeah, get your own mail. It's always nice. Yeah. Love the shirt, by the way. Oh, thanks, the shout man. out to Absolutely, our cancer yeah. awareness. It, Absolutely. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. was in October and we're yep. extending that keggle well, through November. Absolutely. My flannels are either dirty or at the shop, <laughs> so I went with ugly sweater day today, Jay. You know, ladies and gentlemen, uh, last month we posed um, a question to the audience on different topics or actual questions that y'all might have that you'd like to see us answer or actually do a show around. And, uh, you know, for this week's episode, uh, we decided to bring John Janowitz on board because one of the topics that we're covering is by uh, Jim Merrill, one of our viewers, and uh, it was how to develop a lane pattern based around specific topography, okay? okay. Now, JJ, you and I both measured a lot of lanes using conventional methods back in the day, dial indicator, uh, you know, pit gauges, tape measures, the whole thing. It took a long time. Um, do you remember when, when and why we actually started to really focus on topography as a company? I think I kind of re recall being in the late 90s. Um, and I think a lot of that stemmed, the one thing episode I particularly remember was you know, when we did lanes on tour from 97 to 2002, you know, when we first started, I remember, you know, we would pull tapes on two different lanes and, you know, just to make sure everything was fine. And I remember, you know, reading those tapes time and time again, stop after stop, and, you know, the tapes would just be right on top of each other. So we kind of knew that, you know, the machine was doing its job, but we would still get, you know, complaints from guys on tour. You know, they'd say, you know, this pair is hooking an arrow more, you know, this, this end, of, end of the house is a lot tighter, you know, and, but we knew, you know, just by looking at the tapes that, you know, we knew if we did a 40 lane center and we pulled tapes on lane 10, we pulled them on lane 30, if the tapes stack up on top of each other, chances are they're probably It's not good. the equipment. Yeah, it's not the equipment. The so we knew it had to be something else. And I think that's probably when we started, that, that's when I recall starting to look, looking at the topography, you know, since, you know, we knew that the oil part you know, what, what was a constant, and we knew it was right from, from lane to lane to lane, it had to be something else. Well, what was, you know, the something else, it was the surface. You know, and some of, some of the great lanesmen of all time, in, in my opinion, and, and I'm sure yours, and, and we're friends with, the, with most of them as well, you know, Lenny Nicholson, mm -hmm. uh, Sam Baca, the late Lon Marshall, mm -hmm. Kerry Mogart, yep. uh, we can throw a whole bunch in the mix. They were all, as well as John Davis, they were aware of topography in the 70s mm -hmm. but I remember talking to each one of these individuals and them saying you know it wasn't as big of a determining factor mm -hmm. as all of a sudden it came out to be in the 90s and going forward why was topography in your opinion less of an issue uh, you know say even pre 90s yeah. versus now I think uh one, you know, like when we first started doing lanes on tour, I mean, there was definitely a lot more wood lanes, you know, at, at that stage. And, you know, back then, you know, it was pretty common and before the 90s prior to that, you know, for bowling centers to resurface every year. So, I mean, you know, one, people paid more attention to <clears throat> to their lanes to begin with. Also, you know, they would, you know, recoat sometimes every, every six months or every year. So, I mean, you know, and sometimes the bowling centers were doing it themselves. So they were pretty well aware of you know what was going on with their surface and also you know the machines that they used to resurface lanes they were actually very very good at cutting that same flat shape from lane to lane to lane so I mean I think between that and also when it came to tour you know we didn't see they didn't see as much on tour back then because you know they used to do pre-inspections you know I know Lenny used to go you know a few weeks ahead of time and he'd you know set up the patterns and whatnot so if if he did if there was something you know he'd see it much more ahead of time as opposed to you know just showing up you know a day before or two days before and you know, trying to get the machines right and everything. So I think between the, you know, the research, the constant resurfacing and just the fact that, uh, you know, like I said, the, the machines did very good jobs of, you know, 
cutting that same shape from lane to lane to lane. I think that was really a lot of it where they didn't see topography near as much, where services definitely were more consistent from you know house to house. Back and, then. and basically, I mean, as you and I know, as we've been on that side of that coin, I mean, you had something that was relatively simple to repair mm -hmm. because you had equipment that could do it. I mean, if yeah. you had a, a crowning in a, in a certain area, you could sand that out if it wasn't too yep. extensive, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but now, you know, you look at, at today's world, yeah. okay, yeah. Um, we've got a ton of synthetic lane insulations. I mean, wood Absolutely. wood is almost non-existent, with the exception mm -hmm. of maybe yeah. smaller centers or yeah. certain countries that have some, mm -hmm. some historical background with multi-generation proprietors. Right. Um, the cases with synthetics are worse than they ever were with wood. What are some of the reasons for our viewers on that? What are some of the differences, the topographical differences that we run into with a synthetic insulation versus a, a wood lane? I think uh, a lot of it too is, you know, that since the synthetics are screwed down, you know, like you said, there's, you know, depending on who is doing the installation, you know, they, that there's going to be a little bit of variance with, you know, what people think is flat and, you know, how much they screw down on certain boards. The other thing too is, I mean, like with, with synthetics that I've seen, I mean, especially like in this state and a lot of places, I mean, like, you know, they when they first came out with synthetic, they said, oh, it's going to last you 20 plus years and you never have to replace them again. So I think people didn't, you know, they haven't really taken the same kind of care like they did with the wood lanes in the past. And also since the synthetics are now, you know, they've been down so long. I mean, I've run into so many customers in tech support, you know, have had their synthetics, you know, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years. Well, you know, say for example, you know, if they had them flat at one point in time, you look at the front part of the lane, well, you know, that front of the part of the lane has taken a beating from the bowling balls now for, you know, 20 years, 25 years. Well, I mean, it's, it, you know, even if the lane is relatively, you know, relatively stable, you know, what about the wood cribbing underneath? I mean, it's, right. gonna, it's eventually going to buckle after that much of a pounding for, uh, over that many years. So, I mean, whatever shape it might have had, you know, if it was a little crowned beforehand, well, it might still be crowned in the back, but the front's going to be quite depressed. So, I mean, you know, I, I think a lot of that is... Those are definitely some of the factors that definitely go into you know why you know we get some a lot of issues with topography now these days. I agree a hundred percent on that. And the only thing I would add is that you know, um, perfect point on hey, listen, you put in synthetics, 20, 30 years, don't worry about it. And I think what the marketing aspect of that was was more, <coughs> excuse me, the lane surface itself. Which in turn, because visually it didn't look beat up with big dents right. in the heads like you yeah, get with exactly. wood over time, yep. they totally spaced out on everything underneath. Yeah. Cribbing, truss mm -hmm. work, all the foundation yep. that really maintains that, mm -hmm. that good topography mm -hmm. you know, up top. Which kind of brings us to the topic and really diving into Jim's question. And, and you and I actually decided that this is going to be the first part of a two-part right. show because once again ladies and gentlemen to, to broach this this we could literally be here for hours and hours but um, you know how do you take topography or our company uh, how do we take topography in consideration when developing competitive patterns and you know what are some of the things that, that you've seen that if we hadn't done something you know different with that pattern we might have had a, a disastrous outcome at the event right right yeah I mean I think some of it stems with the actual tournament first you know tournament management you know what are they looking for in a tournament you know are they looking for higher scores are they looking for them to be harder are they looking for you know something in the middle you know what what are they trying to look for because like for example like if you know the tournament management is looking for, for lower scores and you know the, the lane surface is very flat or maybe even a little bit depressed we we'll probably know we'll probably have to make the pattern maybe a little bit flatter to keep scores good assuming that you know the the, the uh, talent level is at a, you know, a pretty high level like for example like if, you, if the tournament organizers are looking for lower scores and the center is crowned well you probably you know going a little bit shorter and making people get closer to the crown probably will make scores a little bit lower now if they're wanting really high scores and the center is crowned, you probably don't want to go short, you know. So, I mean, there are little things like that, you know, if, if you know the lane surface is 25 years old and the track's very dominant and they want, you know, low scores, well, you probably want to make it a little bit short and make it a little bit tricky out there, make them play, you know, where the surface is still pretty new on the outside and, you know, a little worn in the middle, like I said, same thing with the park. So, you know, a lot of that has kind of stems to start out with for, you know, what is the, the term and organizers, what are they looking for? That's definitely one of the things. And then, um, you know, like I said, to, you know, we, we just kind of do, um, you know, a lot of pre-inspections as far as, you know, 
actually seeing the topography and like I know myself I mean I'll bring bowling balls just to kind of confirm sure. that you know okay you know, what I see in ball reaction actually matches what I see you know in the topography graphs and pretty much every time they, it always does I mean if it's crowned you know a lot of times if you try going you know inside to out you know, the ball is going to tend to hang down the lane you know if it's depressed you know the ball is definitely going to pick up a little bit sooner it's going to change direction a little stronger so you know like I said it's, it's usually that combination of you know being able to look at the graphs look at the lane surface the wear and actually you know be able to throw balls just to kind of confirm it you know that's that combination kind of the it, it, to, sum, to sum it up simply that's kind of what we look at and for the audience as well, I mean, you know, we don't chase topography across a house, mm -hmm. correct? Like mm -hmm. if you've got a couple of bad pairs, you know, mm -hmm. that is what that is. But if you see something where all of the lanes are predominantly downhill or uphill, yeah. then that would tend to be a point where, listen, we're going to have to yeah. do a, a pattern decision yeah. based on the characteristics of the house. Because we've all had what we call bad pairs or mystery yeah. pairs over the years. Yeah, and until happen. I started working here, you know, he had theories about it as a bowler, but until I started learning about topography, I'm like, ah, oh, that's why seven hooked more than eight at Crossroads Bowl yeah. in 1986 yeah. forever. You know, no <laughs> yeah, matter what exactly. we did on it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes when you're dealing with house conditions, it can mask some of the topography, oh, correct? Absolutely. <clears throat> absolutely. I mean, you know, whenever you put, you know, 11 times the amount of conditioner in the middle that you do in the outside, yeah, you know, balls are going to go go straight in the middle and they're going to hook to the outside. But uh, like I said, now all of a sudden when you start melting the pattern down and you start making it a little bit more honest, and that's where you really start seeing the intricacies in the surface. You start seeing topography show up. So, I mean, and you start seeing those things that, you know, we didn't see years ago with wood lanes. You know, on top of the fact that we weren't using near the amount of oil back then as well, too. You know, all those factors combined definitely kind of create the um, kind of unstable environment at times that we have now. For me, the big visual that this company was at a tournament you bowled in, okay, and it was in 1997, yep. Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. It was a BRC center, I think, yep. at that point. Yep. Sure was. Craig was a mechanic. Mm -hmm. He's still hanging out in that area. Hi, mm -hmm. Craig, if you're watching the yep. show. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a perfect example where, you know, it was a pretty competitive pattern. It was definitely mm -hmm. a competitive field. You were right. out there, Kirk Lamb, mm -hmm. let it. You had John Gaines, eventual winner. Mm -hmm. uh, you had Mike Hoffman, yep. uh, you know, yep. a whole bunch of people out right. there. Right. And I remember, I think it was 29 and 30. And, you know, all of a sudden after the first day, we'd have the sheet where it would have, you know, all the all the names here and then it have all the lane numbers and the scores you bowled on as you went on the pairs and, yeah. and I remember picking up that first sheet and the whole column that stood down there on 2930 looked blank. You know, it was like going across, it was like 220, 20, 210, 20, 140, yeah. 20, 210 and it's like everybody hit that pair. So as a lanesman, especially as a rookie at that point, yeah. theoretically, I'm sitting here going, what happened? You know, we got confidence in our machines, we right. got all the checks. And we found out that the right lane went downhill like a quarter of an inch mm -hmm. from the foul line when we ran a laser on to the pen deck. Right. And it was causing that lane on the same pattern to play up to two feet farther, right. you know, down mm -hmm. lane from oh, a break yeah. point perspective. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, in the layman would look at that as, well, you know, you must have messed up the pair, but that really wasn't the case. Are yeah. there any specific events or venues or experiences that you can pick out of your hat where you saw if you hadn't have made a pattern change, the tournament might have been a disaster. Um, <clears throat> there was one though, specific one where it was in actually in Asia, where I remember measuring the lanes and uh, as a whole, and it varied a little bit from from end to end. But I mean, at, on average, all the lanes went downhill two inches, and I knew that because when I went to go did some, I did a ball video. Like you could actually, I threw a ball. I had my, you know camera sitting at the foul line, I actually threw a ball and literally like half the ball would disappear when by the time it got to the pin. So I was like, oof, I mean, they're probably going to be a little tight here down the lane. So sure, a second when I would put out the longer pattern, it was like, it was, it played really tight. So I had to end up having to shave the pattern back a couple of feet. But like I said, you know, that was, in, but it still played, you know, a lot longer. If I remember right, I think we went 45 feet, I think. But I mean, it still played like we were oiling like near close to the head pin, you know. So, but but knowing that, you know, we were go, we were going short and long in that particular championship. Uh, you know, like I said, it was a good thing to know that uh, you know that uh, that went downhill, and we kind of adjusted accordingly for it. And like also, I remember you know with the uh, when it came to topography, where um, went to, to Europe and one of the one of these other centers that we've visited many times. And uh, the guy there who was the house pro, 
he bowled in that center for 20 years. And I remember doing the, the lane mapping in the center. And I remember sitting down with him asking, because the pair to pair was not very good in that particular center. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I go up and ask him, like, you know, so tell me about nine and ten. You know, and goes, well, ten hooks a little more, and you could see that you know there was more of a depression down the lane on ten. And they said, well, what about lane uh, eleven and twelve? He goes, yeah, eleven's definitely tighter down the lane. You could definitely see, you know, there was definitely more crown down the lane. You know, like literally, like he was just going right from pair to pair, and I'm like, and he's reading off exactly how they, and and he would, he he didn't look at the graphs at all, but I'm just looking at the graphs. I'm like, it just showed exactly what you know he had known for all these years of the differences of pair to pair. I'm like that's where he knew right away that you know it didn't have anything to do with. Oil pattern. Oil patterns a much smaller percentage of the big picture of you know why people score higher in some centers, why left right equity is a lot better in some centers. You know, like I said, it's, it was uh, it was quite an eye opening thing. This was like that was probably like about eight or nine years ago when we did that. And let's you know another eye opener I know for the tour and, and for a lot of the public competitively. Um, you know, I remember doing it in the late nineties. You know, we were drifting away from symmetrical patterns. Mm -hmm going more asymmetrical mm -hmm. the only problem with that was it would not without being able to educate everyone individually and spend time with them yeah. you showed somebody a picture of an offset graph that had left soil on the left and more on the right what was the initial response of, of bowlers mm -hmm. to look mm -hmm. at that you yeah know? it was well you're giving the lefties more friction you're opening yeah. the pattern up and you're you're bumping all yeah. us out and that wasn't no. technically the case yeah. sometimes it was field inequity because there are less left-handers and yeah, there are right-handers, but in a lot mm -hmm. of cases it was it was topographically yeah. dictated. Yeah, <clears throat> exactly. You know, we were, that was one of the things I remember, you know, J.D. used to talk about, you know, back in the day. It was like, you know, if, if you went to those centers where it was a little bit more <clears throat> depressed on the left, or depressed on the left and a little more crowned on the right, where, you know, <clears throat> he might actually add a little bit more oil to try to just balance the friction, because he was always trying to balance the amount of friction on the outside and trying to make it equal from side to side and also I mean when it came to tour I mean you know there was so much more lineage back in the day in the 90s that were really on once a day I mean you know they, they, there was so much more lineage on the right hand side that we had to actually add more oil to the right side to get it to hold up because that was one of the biggest things was you know we tried to minimize the change and that was really the the big thing was you know if, if we can minimize the change <clears throat> we can balance left to right and we can balance scoring pace a little bit easier and you know, when you've got eighty-five percent of the lineage on the right-hand side as opposed to fifteen percent on the left, you don't need the same amount of oil on both sides. And on top of the fact that, um, with the rev rates being so high on oh, yeah. tour, you know, they chopped up the pattern so much faster that we had to add more oil to the right, and and sometimes we had to do more so, more so than others because we we went to some of these centers where the synthetics were twenty years old or they hadn't resurfaced in three years. Well, you know, there was already so much more wear in the ball in the ball track and in the front part of the lane on the right. Where I mean. You know, even if you put the same pattern down, it wasn't even going to play r remotely close Absolutely. from ball one. So we had to do things to try to help balance, you know, the, the friction between both sides. And that was really the, one of the main differences between, you know, it, for the asymmetrical patterns. You know, we weren't trying to shove out the left or anything like that. It was just trying to trying to do our best we can to try to balance both sides and manage the friction on both sides. You know, try to get it a little bit closer to equal. And maybe for some of the younger viewers to touch base on that, you know, what JJ's talking about is there were not reoils for the PBA events. We literally went in at 10 or 11 o'clock or midnight, mm -hmm. and we did the lanes throughout the evening. And then we went back to the hotel after watching some ball reaction, and they bowled what we used to call A squad, B squad, and then A came back and yep. B came back. Yep. Mm -hmm. And by the time you were on that four squad at night, that was you were Robert Smith three-stepping and oh, yeah. the ball return oh, yeah. lane back at that point. As the years time. went by, it got worse and worse and worse. So. Mm -hmm. so all right, let's give the audience a couple of specific examples, you know, on how you'd maybe look at a competitive pattern with a known topography. So let's start with the situation where, um, you know, how about the lanes all predominantly go uphill substantially? If they predominantly go uphill. What are some of the things you do in, in the pattern structure or application that, okay. that you would combat that? Probably, we probably end up having to go a little bit longer just because of the fact that we know the ball is going to slow down a lot more in the back part of the lane. So you know, if we're going to go with a, a given pattern, we probably know that most of them are going to play a little shorter than you know, what it might read on paper. So uh, you know, of course, I'll try to throw balls on it just to kind of reconfirm that as well too. But you know, those would be kind of one of the things. Also, since we know it's going to slow down a little bit more, you know, we might 
be more apt to put a little bit more volume going forward because we know we're going to need a little bit more oil to, get, to help get the ball down the lane since the ball is going to slow down a lot more on its own. So I mean, like those are a couple of things that we might do. Same thing like if we know it's going downhill, we're probably not going to apply near as, near as much conditioner in relation to in, in the, uh, the total volume. We're not going to apply as much going forward in relation to the reverse because we know that the ball is already going to have a harder time That's slowing it. down to begin with. And also, we're not going to go as long as well, too. So, like, those are a couple things where if we know topography front to back, you know, what, what we're dealing with, you know, we'll probably automatically kind of gear ourselves to kind of... Do a length yep. change, a length modification. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. And, and obviously, well, not obviously, because a lot of people don't know because it's a hidden enemy, but yeah. much like a, a putting green, if you're putting uphill and you can see it going uphill, you know the ball's going to slow down. So, yep. you got to hit it harder, what have you, and vice yep. versa. Right. So if you're going downhill, the ball is essentially going to hyperplane, make the pattern mm -hmm. look longer. Yep. If it's going uphill, they're going to feel like the ball's checking up early yep. and, and going that direction. Mm -hmm. What about, uh, you mentioned earlier, like, say, in a crowned situation. Mm -hmm. So you were, you were crowned uh, in the middle, predominantly front to back down the lane, mm -hmm. um, and you wanted a competitive pattern. Mm -hmm. What would you do? Would you do volume change, narrowing, a uh, um, combination <coughs> of, of different things? It would... If, if they were trying to create something a little more competitive, we could probably even get away with, you know, creating a little bit more structure and having a little bit higher ratio of conditioner in the middle because we know that, you know, with the crown, the ball's going to tend to want to hang more toward the outside. So if they want to keep scoring on us, you know, we could probably even go a little easier perhaps and, uh, and still it would be a pretty competitive condition. You know, like also on the, on the flip side, if we know it's going to be pretty depressed, you know, one, we, we know that most of the players are going to probably be playing a little bit closer to the inside, and also we'll probably, to try to help balance the friction that's going to be automatically in the surface, you know, kind of creating that skateboard ramp effect, we'll probably need to add more oil toward the outside, more two to twos to try to help, you know, calm down that friction. Because they're getting yeah. free recovery. Exactly. Since we're saying they leak one exactly. right or left, that, that, that exactly. pressed into that crown's pot mm -hmm. right back in. Exactly. So the ball's going to be seeing, you know, the ball's going to be seeing the the the, um, the depression way more than it'll be seeing the oil. So we know that we'll probably have to make the pattern a little bit flatter if they want a more honest condition. We're going to definitely need to uh, you know like said, add more two to twos, more oil to the outside, and we probably won't need to put as much shape because we know that, like I said, the surface is going to automatically kind of help guide the ball to the pocket anyway. Because in the end, I used to have a saying, which I still hit occasionally, but you can't paint the Mona Lisa on a piece of toilet <laughs> paper. So you've got to have a Absolutely. foundation. Yep. It's set up for the pattern. Yep. You know, as a bowler, I mean, I, I'm one of your biggest fans. Oh, um, you've bowled all over the world in, in all you know, levels of competition. Um, you got a scenario that you can specifically remember, and, and you don't have to name the center, but mm -hmm. where all of a sudden uh, topography across the center made lane play radically different when oh, you yeah. were bowling? Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. I definitely went to a few centers where you know they had the mixed bag and and one of the things that I always like to see at tournaments is you know whether the center was crowned whether it was depressed whether it went downhill uphill I always like to see at least the same all the way across the center you know what made it tough was you know when you start get you get crowns on one side of the center then you get depressions on the other side and then you know, then you get mixed bags between the pairs itself I mean and that's where the scoring pace usually starts going south more than anything else because you know, people get lined up in their 10 minutes or 15 minutes of practice to shoot a good game, and then they move there and, you know, next thing you know, guys are missing the head pin or they're missing the head pin, and, you know, they're going Brooklyn and whatnot, and, and that's what, you know, creates a lot of the confusion. And then, you know, what, what also happens, too, is because some of the pairs are different, the way people start out, you know, some guys will play a little bit farther right, then also some guys will play a little bit farther inside on some of the other pairs where the topography tends to dictate that. So now when they move pairs as well, you know, not only are they fighting the topography, but also, you know, now the oil depletion is different. So now, you know, that's just continually, you know, magnified. So it just makes the, the cross, you know, across the center just much more spooky. But oh yeah, I've definitely seen that more than a few t more than a few times uh, at, at particular centers. No Have doubt. you seen that in a center where you've also bowled in that same center on a dead wall house condition and not experienced as much of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you definitely don't see it near as much. You know, like I said, sometimes you, you'll still see it a little bit, but a lot of times you'll see it more in the mistakes where, you know, okay, if you miss a little right, it just comes off the dry a little stronger, or, you know, if you miss in, the ball just goes a little longer. But... Like I said, you don't really see it a lot until you really start, you know, flattening the pattern out. And then all of a sudden you realize, you know, it goes a little bit longer in the middle. Well, now, you know, like I said, when you, uh, you know, flatten it out a little bit, it goes a lot longer in the middle, you know. Or and all of a sudden, you know, where 
you know, you, you saw it come, come off the dry a little bit stronger. Well, now when you go a little bit flatter, it comes off the dry a lot stronger now. So it's like those were the things where you really started to see magnified when, you know, the pattern got a little bit flatter, you know, when you start getting those ratios a little more to that 2 to 3 to 1 as opposed to, you know, the average house condition, which is around 11 to 1 these days. Uh, you know, like I said, you know, oil, oil can mask some of the deficiencies in the surface, there's no doubt. But still, at, in the end, you know, the surface is still what's going to rear its ugly head if it's if it's really bad. I'll tell you, I don't I don't miss measuring lanes the way we used to do it. Obviously, we've got Lane Mapper now, which is a whole different technology. But when you and I were out there, we and, and other tech staff that were oh, still yeah. here, we were doing every five feet. Yep. We were doing crown suppressions, cross tilts. We were also running a laser, a friction sled. We had pit measurement. I mean, it was just back breaking. Thank God we were in our oh, 20s at that man, time. I, I couldn't what, do it now. Yeah, between your adductors and the hamstrings. I remember there were a few a few nights and you come in the next night after doing that and it was hard walking. I remember that. Yeah. It was like, ugh, it's brutal, brutal stuff. But yeah, glad that technology's on our side <laughs> now. So That's a fact. Do you have any advice for our youth when competing in an unknown venue or an event, maybe observations they could do going in, or you know things that you look at when you go into a place as a bowler. Yeah, there's a couple things. I mean, you know, one, if you if you really don't know anything about the center, I mean, one of the things I always like to look at too is like if you knew that the center, you know, had synthetics and they've been in for a long time. And to me, when it came to going into to new center that, that was the one thing I actually looked at more than anything else is you know what kind of lanes do they have and how long you know how old are they because to me that always told the most right you know about about a center even if you didn't know it didn't know the topography because a lot of times even, even we'll do lanes on in centers and we don't have the time to measure topography it just doesn't really work out so I mean we're not really too sure but I mean you know a couple of things that, that I always looked at was you know, you know one where was the front desk because you know if a center's you know, had their lanes for 20 years Chances are they're going to tend to want to put more of the open play, more of the smaller leagues in front of the front desk. So easier to maintain, absolutely easier, easier to keep wise. an eye on it. And, you know, we customers don't have to walk as far. So you know, over the course of 20 years, you know, 15, 20, 25 years, that's a whole lot more lineage and scratching in the in the surface on those particular lanes compared to you know the ones that are always near the end. And even you know one of the centers I grew up back home that had you know that bold league and had wood lanes. I mean you know you get near the front desk, they hadn't resurfaced in four years, but you know, you get to near the front desk, and you know the lanes look like peanut brittle. You know, in the heads, but then you go down toward the high end. You know, and all of a sudden, it's like these lanes are kind of look brand new. So wow. I'm like, you know, are they going to play the same? Absolutely, they're not going to play Correct. the same. So same thing happens with synthetic. So so if, if I knew that, the age would tell a lot. And um, one of the other things too is, I mean, you know, when in doubt, you know, if you can keep the ball, you know, you're better off always keeping the ball in a little bit straighter line, especially if you know that, you know, it's going to be a little bit more competitive pattern because at least that way transition is a lot easier to read you know where if you're crossing more boards you know now you're crossing some of that those hills and the topography if it's sure. all messed up so now the ball so now when the oil moves around on top of that it's going to be magnified by the by the topography so you know next thing you know it's going to be a whole lot easier to two eight ten and or big fourth you know five to the middle you know when you're crossing more boards through transition as opposed to when you're keeping it a little bit more straighter keeping the ball roll a little bit more end over end so you know, those are probably the, the two biggest things that i i always looked at and you know a couple things i always you know tried to you know, follow as uh, when I went to centers where I didn't know much about the, you know, the characteristics. Excellent of advice. And mm -hmm. still, shortest distance between two points is a straight, straight line, line, my friend. That Absolutely. math does not lie. Mm -hmm. JJ, I can't thank you for coming out enough. Absolutely. Brother, brother. the next segment yep. we're going to do on this, uh, I think we talked about going mm -hmm. down on lane, maybe yep. showing the audience some of the tools and getting a little bit more in depth on what actual topography is from a visual perspective as mm -hmm. much as we can show it. But uh, at that point, man, that's a wrap, brother. Okay, sounds Ladies good. Ladies and gentlemen, keep those wrenches turning and have a wonderful day.